I think I just started to, to kind of find my way back into photography. When I came back after COVID, that's when I got the studio. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when you, we had this really strange moment when I'd gone to see, so I'd gone to see Dave Shrimpton for the first time yeah. because I'd become absolutely enchanted by this wet plate um, process, the collodion process. And, and I'd been to see David. And, um, and he, he brought down, he was sharing all the influences that he'd had. And he brought down this book of Interutka, this uh, photographer, a Latvian photographer. That's right. He showed me this incredible work of just beautiful, beautiful captures of, of ordinary folk in Latvia. And, um, and the next day we went up to see my boy in Loughborough. And I'm sat at the end of my boy's bed and David emails me. And he said, hey, have you come across this photographer? And it's Interutka. So I think I said, Gee, you're shitting me or something like that. Mm. And, and we literally, within 24 hours of me being introduced to this lady's work, yeah. you then said, hey, have you seen this lady's work? Yes. And it was quite strange because I'm usually not into that sort of art. And it came across to me and I felt that somehow it kind of resonated for that project. As soon as I kind of saw this process in action, it was just, I was, it was magical. It was... It, it wooed me. It's, it's a you know, seducing process. And so I knew that this was a journey I wanted to make. <clears throat> and so started this. I never realized how long it would take and how hard it was to get everything together. But, you know, so it's, it, there's no wonder there are only probably about a thousand practitioners on the planet who do this. Because it's, it's not something you could decide to do one day and be doing the next. Um, but that started my journey. That was, that was over two years ago now when I did that, but it was, uh, and it was everything I could then was about trying to make it happen and what do I need and, you know, what cameras do I need, what lenses do I need, what equipment do I need, what do I need to change about the studio? And then I wasn't even at the time thinking about what I'd produce, it was more about can I be in a position to produce it? What hat do I need? Yeah. What bowler hat do I need to find? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, and then I think what happened pretty much was that, um, I'd kind of, I think we'd started to have more regular conversations then. And, um, but I do remember the day that, that you came along and, and mentioned, you know, the whole Renoir thing. Uh, and you had that mischievous look in your eyes where you clearly had got an idea. Yeah, And yeah. that was when you talked about how he threw down the gauntlet to that photographers couldn't capture the movement of light. That's right. I mean, we, Jack and I were intrigued by that quote because... To be honest, we were looking for reasons and exciting reasons to open up the Renoir project from a fine art display into like um, a community celebration. And uh, we felt that challenging the fact that Renoir thought that it was impossible at the time to capture the movement of the light with with a camera would be an exciting project if we have the right photographer but also would be a, a great uh, narrative to engage the families. I don't think we were aware at that time either, where, certainly I wasn't quite where photography was at in Renoir's time. I didn't know the detail or the history of actually it was wet plate, it wasn't dry plate, or yeah. what those things really meant. I was just aware it was at the advent of photography, but I perhaps hadn't given a great deal of thought to what photography looked like at that time. Yeah. In the same way as we talk about Renoir coming here in September 1883, I hadn't thought about steamboats or how he'd got here you know or what his experience was like and I think as we were exploring that side of things you're right it was what does that look like who is how do we go about making that a project it was only in the late 1880s and early 1890s that the dry plate came into introduction so when when we talked about the movement of the light as we started to the wet plate process seemed to just lend itself with the that beautiful kind of angel of chance that happens with the chemicals on the plate. It just seemed, you know, and that was my excitement when you mentioned it, yeah. and the challenge that you kind of threw down, or shall we, with, you know, with that mischievous grin saying, shall we, shall we see what we can get, you know? And I remember you saying, you know, we might not get anything. That was the exciting bit for me. We didn't expect you, or ask you, or commission you to capture the movement of the light, because that would not have been too artistic in my book. We told you we couldn't care less if you succeed in capturing (laughs) the movement of the light. And I think that was the right approach because then what are you going to do? I mean, you are somebody who thinks is the right person, 
but you can't order the outcome, right? Otherwise, it's not an art project. So I think we did well to say that. I think it kind of relaxed you a bit as well. I was going to say more or less pressure. Right. Uh, no, I, I, actually, in truth, it, it helped because actually, you, you know, there's enough pressure. I put enough pressure on myself. Yeah. But when you, I still remember when you said that that day. There was just that sense of right. I can just relax into this process now and see what we get. You know, Sally Mann talks about. She quotes Proust a lot by saying that he used to pray for the angel of certainty. Mm -hmm. And Sally Mann, you know, my, my hero in photography and art, um, she said that she prays for the angel of uncertainty uh, when using yes. collodion because, because when you pour the collodion and all the chemicals kind of mix together and then you apply that light comes through that lens and you make that imprint on the glass, you just don't know how they're going to caress and collide and make this magical moment. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, so it's wonderful just because you're always, you know, you hold your breath as you, as you pull the glass plate out and you look at the negative image that you've got once you pour the developer on and then you just, you know, I remember shaking sometimes down, down in the valley and thinking, this looks good, we've got something on this one and you put it into the fix and it's just, it's just marvellous but, but saying there's no pressure was huge. Why the movement of the light? Why is this narrative, why did it come up in Renoir's mind? And, and the answer to that is Moulin Wet which is a, a very special, almost unique spot with a unique angle for light that not only Renoir appreciated, but that pretty much every single artist that we bring to the island are mesmerized yeah. with. You know, the playfulness of the, of the argument between who could capture the movement of light, mm -hmm. that the photographers would generally say that we're actually using the light physically yeah. mm -hmm. to capture this image, which is quite an interesting um, aside. You'd think that on a clear day, mm -hmm. you would capture the most interesting pieces and plates, but actually it was, on the, it was on the overcast days where the light seemed to dance more and the movement of the chemicals with that light, yeah. um, I think got us some of the most you interesting those, images we, we've got. There's stark changes, don't you, when yeah. a cloud comes over and then there's a little break in it and yeah. then it's a bit more moody or there's a dark cloud coming. There's one particular plate that you you like a lot don't you where there's that that sort there's of that just the, strip of silver on the horizon yeah. Yeah. and that's really interesting because when you when you're using digital you kind of drop the aperture quite quickly and can work quite quickly to do that and then you you're faced with this process and i'm thinking how the hell do i do that you know because it's i've got to it's taking me 15 minutes to get and the lights then disappeared so the process, sometimes I'd be down there all day and just do two plates because you, you time, you're trying to time it so that you, when you pour the collodion on, you've literally got 15 minutes then before it's too dry. But if you don't time it right, you miss that moment. So it's, it's far more complicated. But thankfully, we got one plate that seemed to capture that, that effect that you're talking about. We love risks. You know? I know you do, but we definitely love risks. Uh, and uh, we find them very amusing. Uh, risks. Risks are fun. And I remember um, I kind of could see somehow the jigsaw coming together where inevitably uh, our friends of Giverny would be like intrigued by what we are doing and inevitably they would ask at some point or if they don't ask we would kind of like softly push <laughs> for some of Paul's picture to be part of the show. And I remember the first time I, 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 I spoke to uh, uh, Cyril about it. He, he, he kind of like was like, po, 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 Paul who? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I said, don't worry, he's a fan of Sally Mann and this and that. And, we, uh, and then I explained the narrative and how exciting it is. And, and he was like, oh, well, okay. He, he knew we can be slightly wacky sometimes. But then it kind of, at the end of the journey, it was more them asking me, do you think Paul Chambers would accept to uh, uh, loan us some of his artworks and this and that? And that's very satisfactory because uh, it's part of our remits. I mean, ultimately, every single artist we work with, the holy grail for them, and I can understand, is to be on show within a museum. But I often think that this is one of the questions you first asked me as well. I often think that when people are exhibiting, it's more about them than the story they're telling. 
Mm. And what one of the things, because you'd said to me, I remember when we had that coffee outside, and you said, have you had any exhibitions? And I, I'd said, my work doesn't tell a story that's worthy of an exhibition yet, mm. but one day it will be. Mm -hmm. That was the day that I went and, and took eight plates in one day, which was the most I'd done. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew I'd only got one day in this particular spot. And, uh, and the first one was, it was everything everywhere. And, and I think by the third, I would have normally given up and mm -hmm. said, you know, screw it, we'll come back another day. But I couldn't, because that was the only day I'd got. And, um, and I, and I kind of got to a point where I'd, I'd got the chemicals right after four plates. And the movement was there, but I thought there's too much movement. Actually, it's, it's too impressionist. And I wanted something more traditional. So I changed the lens. And the next one, it was the seventh one. And, um, and it was underexposed. So that wasn't just about then quickly clicking again and five yeah. minutes later, that was another hour on it. And, and I, I moved the landscape. So I moved, because the light had changed. And it was later in the day and I thought, right, I need to lower the, the horizon. Mm -hmm. And the eighth plate came out and it was, you know, it was, I think the strongest plate probably of all the plates I took. Yeah. And it actually made me quite emotional when it, and I knew that day, I knew as soon as I saw the negative, that as soon as, so, and then it was like, I, I was shaking, my hands were shaking because I thought, if I drop this glass, <laughs> this is screwed. <laughs> and, then, and so just gently putting it in the fix and then seeing it come out and it was, it was a wonderful moment, wonderful moment. Yeah, I think you did capture the movement of the light and at least using your artistic sense and craftsmanship in kind of a two distinct manner. One, you play it with a lens, like somebody can play with a, the size of a brush. And two, you understood that your chemical process is part of the artistic process and then you played with that as well to make it more wavy and this and that. And that is no different from what an artist well, does, or in that instant, what Renoir did. He used his creativity and his kind of tools to present, create that. And I don't think that he fully appreciated that a photographer at the time could play around with the lens and with the chemical process like he can do with uh, the texture of the canvas or the paintbrush and so on. So that's very interesting. That's right here that I just uh, kind of fully grabbed that. And with the same constraint on timings as well. Timing. Yeah. If you take the, the oil painters we're working with today, the likes of Dima, he talks about that five minute window of the lights only here five minutes. Yeah. I can only paint in this short window, otherwise it's gone, it's moved, and you're facing the same challenge with the technology. So there's kind of an equivalent part here of, it's fleeting. Yeah. I think it's something that's always captivated me about Mullen I used to go there a lot as a kid. And it's, it's kind of sort of like some Jurassic playground in a way, you know, it's removed from this century. And your photography has really amplified that. I, often when I show people your work for the first time, I talk about it being like a time machine, yeah. that you're instantly transported back into this other place, that it's nostalgic immediately. But I quite like that when you arrive at Malin Wet, you can't get there quickly. When I photographed from the car park, you know, and I was lugging this huge camera on tripod, um, and then having to run back down to where the, the dark room was to, you know, it was, <laughs> It was exhausting, you know, and, I, and there, there were there were days when I thought, really, can I just get a digital camera? And then and then you then you get Photoshop. a plate, a plate, yeah, <laughs> a plate that comes through, and you go, no, this is this is why you do it. If it, you know, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, and and it's hard because that's what makes it great. How much did you look at Renoir's work when we first put that challenge on the table? Did you look at his work in Milan Wet and start to look for the movement of the light and ask yeah. questions of it? And how did that play out? in terms of what you were seeing and then with the lens through photography where do i go with that what i looked for, i did i i'd um i was looking to see which i felt would translate because i think we'd been honest enough to say that sometimes you perhaps wouldn't take the exact same frame of course, yeah. that, and actually some of them you can't because where he actually painted from you physically can't you know you wouldn't see anything but, but no, I did look at Renoir and I, and I, for the first time, I really took a look at his life. But I, I found his character really intriguing. 
and, and could connect with a lot of the self-doubt that he had. Um, and I felt that quite cathartic to work, to be working in the very space 140 years later, where he was riddled with doubt. I was riddled with doubt in the sense of, what the heck are we going to get? Can I do this? Um, and, I, and I have to be honest, I was conscious of that sometimes. Mm. And so I tried every day that when things weren't quite going right, and I had to slow myself, I had to stop myself from rushing, because as soon as you rush with this process, that's when the craziest things happen and, and you lose plates or drop them. So I, I did find myself sort of, from time to time, digging into, I wonder what he was thinking. I wonder what was going through. You know, was there a point in the time that he was here that he suddenly, he suddenly felt okay about himself? Mm that he, he was more hopeful, um, that he could see a path out of this depression or this lack of self-esteem or this. Um, and as, and as, as I kind of got the, the odd plate after odd plate that, that seemed to work, you know, I thought, I wonder if that's how he felt when he, when, he, when he found that something worked and the light hit and he managed to capture something and, you know, he smiled. He, he allowed himself a smile that he knew he was onto something. Um, so yeah, it was for the first time. I think that was probably the the strongest connection I've had with another artist as I've been working to try and connect him to, to perhaps how they were feeling at the time and whether there was anything similar going on within my own journey.